Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today, we have got episode number 59 for you all. And the time is here. Actually, matter of fact, let me let me do something right quick before I even before we even get too into it. Um, I said I was gonna do this since the finals is around, so give me one second. Let me get the little, the little uh. trophy up. Let me get let me see if I can find a good spot for it. Let me get Larry OB on the screen, man. Because this is <laughs> what we're playing for now. That's all right. I need one of those. Huh? I need one of those. Bro, it was like low-key, like 30 bucks off Fanatics quietly. And this is how you know I'm a cheapskate. If y'all can see on YouTube, it's the Milwaukee Bucks edition from 2021. <laughs> <laughs> Not a Bucks fan. Don't care that much about their ring, but I'm I just dead. wanted the Larry O'Brien trophy. Facts. They all That's came hard. with the, the faceplate. They, I think they do one now every year um, for every single team that wins. That's but hard. I since like that. we plan for the Larry O'Brien trophy, we want to make sure the Larry is – is represented. I wish I had a better stand or something to put it on. Um, but this episode is a special episode because the NBA finals are set. We are going to be giving you our full NBA finals preview, walking you through the matchups, the schemes, our picks, as well as to who we think are going to win. And I'll say on the front end, it's been hard to really pick the Celtics or the Mavericks in this one, I, I've really gone back and forth both ways. I think I texted you and told you, somebody asked me a couple of days ago who I thought would win. I said the Celtics. Somebody asked me the next day. I told them the Mavericks. So I, I really had to sit and think about matchups and schematics and the different things that both coaches could utilize um, back and forth throughout the series. I think it is going to be a very good series. I think it's going six or seven games at least. And I don't have any dog in this fight, despite what some of y'all may think. If you're watching, you see, I do have one say, of I don't know, man. jersey. You look like a mass <laughs> fan to me. I don't know. <laughs> this is strictly because, for those of y'all I don't know, if you're watching, you probably could kind of tell I have a, a little Dirk jersey up there. Dirk is my favorite player ever. And, you know, for me, just it felt on brand. It felt right for the occasion. Dallas makes their first NBA Finals since Dirk, you know, went on the greatest Finals run of all time. Knocking out the heatles, you know. I, I just throw the jersey on. It felt it felt right. It felt right. Um, but with that though, going to get the housekeeping out of the way. Like, comment, subscribe to the the, the YouTube channel. If you're listening on audio platform, you drop a five star review and then pause us and go over to the YouTube channel and like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Um, before we get into everything NBA Finals related, Dane, how we feeling, bro? How we doing? It's the We'll be what we wait for all year. What we play for. You feel me? This. What 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 they play for? It's time now, brother. It's time. I am bored because the finals don't start until like right. June 6. <laughs> so in reality, right now I'm bored, but I am excited for when the finals actually does kick off. So I think that's gonna be a really, really, really good finals. I think it's gonna be a very close matchup. Um, I think there's a lot of there's, there's so many ways you could look at it for picking either team. Um, so many reasonings to pick either side, which I think makes it even more interesting. Um, so I'm excited, man. I'm excited to see how it goes. I'm excited to see who wins. I'm excited to see what somebody get their first ring. You know what I mean? Because I think the only person getting uh, there's actually no, well, technically Drew Holiday as well, but like Kyrie's the only guy that would get his second ring. But as far as like you know, Luca, Tatum, Jalen Brown, like those guys, somebody's getting their first ring, right? So. Yeah, I'm excited, man. I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, and I, I have a segment once you really like dive into the full preview of just a list of all of those key storylines. Because because it's something I said um, in the video I posted after Game Five of the Western Conference Finals um, was I feel like this Finals really has it has something for everybody. If you're a guy who is all about the the tween tween hezzy Twitter. You just you hear for the highlights, you hear for the just wow moments, right? The the ooh, pure uh, hoops, the one v one, the shot making, bro. Luca, Kyrie, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, they got it covered. The shot making in this finals is gonna be crazy. Hey, Payton Pritchard, don't. To, to, hey, hey, you're right. You're right. Jaden Hardy. Did it? Hey, he was he was looking like he had a little bit in him. He had a little right. bit in him. Um, if you if you're somebody that loves 
loves the X's and O's, really love to dive into the different types of defensive coverages that teams can throw at people. I don't know if there could have been a better matchup. Yeah. Jason Kidd has coached a hell of a playoff run with what he's been able to do on the defensive side of the ball. And then obviously we know what the Celtics have from both a personnel perspective and then schematic wise on that side of the ball. If you're just somebody that's here, a casual for the, for the drama, it got that too. Kyrie back in Boston, Porzingis back against Dallas, Jason Kidd trying to go for a, a, a ring as a player and a coach for the same franchise. It, it's, it's something for everybody in this final. I can't wait. I cannot wait for Thursday. I'm going to be so locked in to this finals because I think it's it's going to blow last year's finals. Oh, my gosh. Oh, it's not even going to be close like compared to viewership, compared to hype, compared to – it's not even close to last year. So, yeah, I'm ready to get into it, man. I'm ready. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, before we get into everything NBA finals related – I'm um, going to continue the segment that we've been running, which is quotes of the week, because I got some good ones here. I think it's four quotes and one that's not a quote. And I'm going to start with not a quote uh, because I just really wanted to bring it up on a podcast, to be honest with you. Um, the cheapest tickets, according to Tick Pick, which is uh, one of the various ticketing platforms that people can buy them on. Um, for every single game of the NBA Finals, and I have it for apparently, I don't even know how you can buy a ticket for game five, six, or seven. Like, that's that's a that's, scam, that's crazy. <laughs> um, mm. but for game one, $793, game two, $853, game three and four, you're looking at basically a thousand dollars to literally touch those freaking ceiling in Dallas. Mm. <laughs> Game five, twelve hundred and thirty dollars. Game six, eighteen hundred dollars. In game seven, seventeen hundred dollars. I mean, that's I'm a not, that's sad. a lot of people whole paycheck, bro. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, I, I'm, I mean, I'm honestly, I'm not surprised though, because I mean, it's the finals. You know, it's like it's yeah. the NBA finals. Don't get me wrong, paying seventeen thousand, no, seventeen hundred for nosebleeds, bro. To watch on the jumbotron and. And I know for a fact, this is the ticket price. You know all these websites, Ticketmaster, all that, Vivid right. Seats. They, all of a sudden, you bought a $1,700 ticket, $500 processing fee. You got to pay another 200 in tax. Parking's mm. like $60 because it's the NBA final. All you of a sudden, that $1,700 ticket is like $2,700. Exactly. So, no, nah, it's insane. Though. The price of every, the price of uh, these tickets is insane. But, I mean, it is the NBA finals. It's supposed to be a good finals as well. So, right. obviously, it's going to be one a lot of people going to want to watch. So, it makes sense. But I'm not paying, I'm not paying that. I, not I, will not be, I will not be attending the finals. I'll tell you that right now. I, I, I look, I, hey. If you got to connect and you you like the off the glass podcast and you you feel me want to send me a ticket to a game, hook your boy up. Other than that, I will be on my couch. I tell you one thing though, six a uh, thousand uh, six hundred eighty is better than seventeen hundred. So if you use the cold off right. the glass, you know, hold up, hold up. Off. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm, saying, <laughs> you know what I'm that's, saying that's parking. That could be nah, yeah, part of parking. A third of parking. Yeah, a, third, a third of parking. That could be I popcorn. Even know I went to a the, a UFL minor league football game at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, and they was charging thirty for parking. So it, I paid I paid forty for when I went to the Lakers Nets uh, game. It was, I paid forty for parking. The broad but uh, food was like that twenty don't even cover the food. No, it really don't. I bought a beer. It was twelve dollars. <laughs> Insane, bro. They be. T- Accident in there, right. but it is it, so it is. just for that. That's why you should be using code off the glass, all one word off the glass. Get $20 off your first CD order because you know, as soon as you step in the venue, you get taxed. No, Save no. a little money here and there because you're gonna need it. <laughs> you're gonna need it. Mm-hmm. Next quote I got for you, and I saw that you actually mentioned this one on Twitter, so I want to, I want you to talk about it on the podcast. <laughs> uh, Rasheed Wallace says that the 2004 Pistons would quote. Beat the shit out of the 2017 Golden State Warriors and went on to say, for the simple fact that they can't match up with us at any position. What are we talking about, bro? I think my exact quote to you was, Y'all would have got dog walked. I think that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> because, bro, what are you talking about? The old four Pistons, granted, got you. Tough defense, cool. That's nice. But y'all scored like 70 points a game, bro. 
Y'all, bro, the game would be over at halftime. Yeah, don't have the offensive firepower to keep up, bro. Like, I'm pretty sure the next thing in that clip he said was like, Steph Curry can't check Rip Hamilton. <laughs> Bro, and I think I uh, what what he said as well was he said you know how many screens Rip Hamilton come off of? Yeah, you know I mean, are we screens not talking about Steph? Steph come off of? Yeah. What, are we, what are you talking about? We're talking about Steph Curry, bro. He's gone, bro. Yeah, it's I get it, bro. It's cool. Y'all won a championship. Y'all beat my Lakers to win a championship. I won a championship. You got your one ring. Like I was like, like, you know what I'm saying? That's fine. Don't throw your name in conversations you don't belong in, bro. The O four Pistons. Are nowhere in conversation right. of the 17 Warriors, 96 Bulls, 01 Lake. Like, you're not in those combos, bro. All Let's right. just relax a little bit. And, bro, I hate the – we would have just – bull. they can't guard us. We just would have been tough, hard-nosed defense. Like, bro, y'all would have got dog-walked, bro. This is not – they would have been shooting y'all out the gym. <laughs> like, y'all have would have had nothing for that. I'm right. telling you. And of all the Warriors teams to pace, you going to pick the one with KD on it? But bro said KD can't guard Tayshaun Prince. I was like, bro, No, he did not. What are we talking about? Dude said, he said, KD can't guard Tayshaun Prince. He said, stop it. Like, who do y'all, bro, what are we talking You realize we're talking about Steph, KD, Prime Clay, Prime Draymond, like, Iggy. Like, bro, come on, bro. This Stuff like that. That's why I respond. I'm just like, all right, yeah, y'all got dog walked. That's not even. Don't even waste your breath, bro. That 04 year was uh, Tayshaun Prince averaged 10 points. <laughs> what do y'all think I was doing, bro? <laughs> what do y'all think hey, I was doing? No, what do you it's think no you had? Tayshaun nah, Prince disrespect, was dog. Disrespect. He's disrespect. Just, disrespect. Yeah. I'm disrespecting <laughs> y'all. Because yeah, cause it's disrespectful that you put your name in this convo. So now I'm disrespecting y'all. Because it's just fair. 10 points a game in KD. I'm disrespecting y'all now. Because you're being, you're, your name does not belong in these convos. Stop. That's fair. That's it's fair. Wallace. Like, I'm just not even like, 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 all right, in conversation when it's like, um, you see like Shaq and Draymond go at it. Shaq is like, who's stopping me? Da, da, da. That's Shaq talking. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. Rasheed Wallace was a, a very good player. He was not no Shaq. He's not no KD. He was not no Steph. Like, like right. just don't put your name in these combos, bro. Stop it. Let's not do that. Very fair. Next quote I got for you is from Stephen A. Smith himself, who said that he can make a case for Kawhi that he is the worst superstar in the history of sports. Followed it up by saying, You have the audacity to literally want to represent Team USA. You can't even represent the Clippers in 60% of the playoff games, but you want to be able to play in the Olympics. Knowing him, he'll probably get hurt and won't be available for the Clippers. Uh, I'm trying to think of a worse superstar. I'm pretty – obviously, I'm sure there's worse superstars. I've a thousand Leonard. percent worse superstars. Uh, yeah, because, but I'm, the thing is what's holding me up is like, what do you classify as a superstar then? Because if it's just a lead guy on a team, then there's – Tuh, hundreds of worse superstars than Kawhi right. Leonard. Because Kawhi Leonard still I don't care has what rings. he do. This man is a two-time, two right, two rings, two-time Finals MVP winner. Right. He's His not legacy is there. stamped. He don't got to play again. He's walking into the Hall of Fame easily. Like exactly. He's just his Clippers tenure. Just to say his Clippers tenure is a failure. You can just put it that way. Right. Um. But I also do kind of agree with the Team USA stuff. It's like I don't. I don't think extra games is. Yeah, you don't need to be doing that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, it never clicked in my mind when I saw the roster. I was just like, okay, they got Kawhi. But they, when I think about it, it's like, why are you playing? Like, you can't even play in the, the playoffs like, for your team, right. bro. Like, you need to order rest as much game. rest as possible. Right. You don't need to add more games in your body. Why are you playing for Team USA? So I agree with that point, though. But the worst superstar, that's a little bit exaggeration. Yeah, I think he, he took it too far. Next quote I have is from Josh Hart who said, I believe on his podcast, he said, looking at just impact, I might put Derek White over Jason Tatum. Look at every main play in the last six minutes of the fourth quarter or overtime. Every big play he, and he's talking about Derek White, made. He's one of the most impactful players Mm. because he just does everything on the court and and does it at a very high level. So with that being said, Josh Hart, you're more impactful than J.B., you know, coming from him, yeah, you do have more on the court than he does. You've hit big shots, and that means you're more impactful than JB. But in reality, that's that's stupid. <laughs> like we, the, the Derek White discourse is getting crazy. Like I seen Derek White's better than Jalen Brown. They like 
we got to realize, bro, he's what he's doing, what he's doing, because he is not the number one or number two or eh, sometimes he's number three. But he's not the number one or two on the team. Right. That, like it's different when you don't get you don't get guarded by the best guy. You don't see the same coverages like you get obviously more open looks. It's, I don't want I don't. Why do I mind explaining my basketball to Josh Hart? Like what? He knows basketball more than me. What are we talking about? I hate getting these uh, getting these convos where I feel like I gotta explain basketball to former NBA players or analysts. What? What are we doing? Current, current. current. <laughs> like I hate. Like I've got to cover and explain the like simple stuff to people who should know it. It's so stupid. Yeah, I, I think it's it does a disservice because I understand what you're trying to do, right? Like you you really want to prop up Derek White. You want to give him the praise. But you don't gotta take down what Tatum is doing for that. Like, mm-hmm. just say that he's a role player who is one of, if not the best role player in the NBA. Mm-hmm. You but can even say he's th- more than a role player. You could talk him up like, you know, honestly, I think he's more than a role player. I think he's a legitimate, you know, quality. Not, a, I wouldn't even say star, but he's more than a role player. That's talking him up without, like, saying he's more impactful than Jason Tatum. Like, yeah, it, it, it's too far. Um, keeping it on brand with the Celtics, though, Um Shoot, I actually didn't even write down who this is from. Hold up. Hold up. Oh, this is from Evan Turner. I do have it down here. Yeah. Evan Turner said on his podcast with, uh, was it the point forward with Iguodala? Said that if you put Jalen Brown on any other team, maybe in the top four, your team is in a position to win a championship and probably be favored just like it is now. Wait, him on the Celtics without Tatum or him on any team? Like Any what? of these like last four teams, if, if Jalen basically is saying if Jalen Brown was the the one A, the guy on any team <clears throat> that's left in these these finals, like your team would be just as good to win a championship and still be favored. He basically is saying like Jalen Brown is a is, top. Like, yeah, he's a guy. He's a guy. You could he can be the number one on a championship level team by himself. Doesn't need to be with Tatum. I mean, like. Sure, I get. I mean, you don't. You haven't seen it, you know. Like, right. I mean, I'm sure if you put Jalen gave Jalen Brown his own team, that probably it'll be a good team. I, I, um, I, I'm not mad at the take, and I, right. I, it's gonna, it's gonna go real easily into when we pivot uh, to talking about this, this Celtic series against the the Pacers, where they, you know, obviously swept them to get to the finals, but. Jalen Brown won Eastern Conference Finals MVP. Yeah, he's not. Yeah, he's a he is a like one of the best players in the league. So I mean, that's not like a horrible take i guess yeah and it's not like knock that's what i mean like it's, that's not a take that also knocks someone else right um it's just like talking up Jalen brown which is fine because i mean no one thought a guy like harden would go to houston and win mvp so like no one would know what would happen if Jalen brown had his own team what the numbers he'd put up what the accolades he'd win so it's just um if you're thinking that that would happen i'm not fully opposed to that yeah uh but with that right let's let's get right into Quickly recapping these last uh, conference finals games because obviously both series wrapped up since we last recorded. Um, starting off with the Celtics transitioning off of that last quote, they sweep the Pacers in what was, I think, fair to say, a competitive sweep. <laughs> uh, the Pacers were in all all but one of these games except for, for game three. Uh, and, and if we're being honest with ourselves, could have won – at least game one. Game one and three. Uh, not, yeah, not sorry. Not game. They weren't in game two. They should have won games one. They, they definitely should have won game one. They had a real case to win game three. Game four was was tight down to the wire, but obviously without Halliburton, it's tough, even though Nemhard put on the performance of his life. Um, he showed a lot of people that his bag is deeper than just being that guard off the bench. Like He really... Mm can take on a full-time point guard role, um, probably made himself a good amount of money in the future. It felt very eerily kind of like when we saw Jalen Brunson um, on the Mavs, where it was like, whoa, can this guy do this like on a bigger scale? Um, So it, it felt very similar to that. But at the end of the day, what it really boiled down to is for a team like the Celtics who I think we've both been critical of, and it's one of the biggest criticism of this criticisms of this team that their offense really goes stale. Their their clutch time offense in the fourth quarter is not the best. They 
outperformed and out executed the Pacers down the stretch in every single one of these games, especially games one, um, game one, game three, and game four, where they needed to, like it was close down the wire. And game three was the one where they came back from, I believe it was down 18 at one point um, to, to come back and win that game. So that was that's that's huge for this team to to at least be able to put that narrative to bed a little bit. Obviously, some people are not going to, or, or I should say it this way, they're going to take it with a grain of salt because at the end of the day, they did it against the Indiana Pacers. And this Mavericks team, I think, is, is fair to say, far and away the best team that they've played the entirety of this playoff run, which I'll say it again, you can't fault the Celtics for. They could only play who was put in front of them. But at the end of the day, um, I, I was impressed with how the Celtics executed down the stretch. I think we both mentioned it. I would have loved if they would have just convincingly straight out beat this Pacers team. But at the same time, you do kind of got to tip your cap to guys like TJ McConnell and Miles Turner, um, Halliburton, while he was healthy. Like they played a good series. His Pacers team. It's very difficult to defend. They play so fast paced. So I think it's a combination of at the end of the day, this is a team in the conference finals. I think they understood that they're playing with house money. I don't think a lot of people, almost nobody expect them to go that far. So for them to be in that position, like they're just leaving it all out there. Like there's no type of fear or pressure for them. They're expected to lose. Um, so they, you know, they really put up a, a valiant effort, like I said, being in all but one of these games, even though they ultimately get swept. Um, but with that, Jalen Brown wins Eastern Conference Finals MVP um, off of a massive game four performance um, where he goes for 29 points. He also had a 40 point game in this series as well. Um, he was phenomenal. Tatum was great throughout this series. I really like to watch his playmaking, that pass he had behind the back out to, to Horford in the corner. Mm -hmm. That's a ridiculous, uh, ridiculous pass. Drew Holiday had some huge defensive moments. Obviously, Derek White, just like Josh Hart said, the impact <laughs> that he can provide um, was huge throughout this series. Um, the Celtics were able to, to show off their depth, You know, being able to get, get guys like Xavier Tillman, Pritchard involved, Sam Hauser is able to come in and be a floor spacer for them. They've got a couple of options off the bench that they can roll with, and now – Getting Porzingis back for what it sounds like will be ready for game one of the NBA Finals will be huge. That allows them to add more flexibility with guys like Horford um, to play him in different spurts of minutes and not be as reliant on him to be their starting center. Um, it, it's all huge for Boston. Uh, but really want to get your thoughts on this sweep as a whole and uh, what this means going into the Finals specifically for the the combination of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum now that, that Jalen Brown has won the MVP. And I've already started to see that discourse rant back up again, as it always does, that maybe Jalen Brown is the better of the two in Boston. <sighs> that, yeah, that, that's inevitable. That's always going to yeah. be there. But, um, no, nah, man, I mean, honestly, so obviously, yeah, like I said, the Celtics sweep the Pacers. Um, no one's really surprised about them winning the series. No one even surprised about them sweeping. Um, there is some talk, like you said, just about how it all happened, how, you know, obviously they should have lost game one. They could have lost game three, um, even was in, like, closer games with even with Halliburton out for some of the game, or, no, or at least for game four. Um, but the biggest thing I'd say um, – is I mean honestly they they still got the wins like they got it done like at the end of the day it was it the best was it the prettiest no mm -hmm. would you have liked to see a bunch of blowouts I mean you could say that yeah but then there probably would have been a bunch of people saying like ah like they're not tested they didn't get tested at all this whole play. it's a lose lose situation but I do think and I I'll, I'll add an extra question towards you for this um do you feel like you feel differently about the Celtics because this was a close series about the Pacers versus let's say they still sweep Indiana, but it was like they're winning each game by 15 plus 10 plus They have like a 20, 30 point game in there. Like, how, do you feel, would you feel any differently about them against Dallas? If that's how their series went versus how it went, where obviously they still swept them, 
but it was a very competitive sweep where it came down to the wire in three out of four of those games. Um, I feel a little bit better if they just kind of if they blew them out a little bit or just like really like one handedly. Um, because then that would just give me more of the view of like, all right, this is actually might be a juggernaut type of team. Because mm-hmm. in reality, if you just look at everything that they have, as far as like obviously they have, um, on a top, let's just say worst case seven, what player in the NBA in Jason Tatum, they have another like all NBA caliber guy in Jalen Brown. They have a great all all around roster. They added Drew Holiday, Kristaps Porzingis, great team defense. They can hit threes. They can just they're so well put together. Um, obviously they won what sixty plus games in the regular season. Like they looked like this elite team all year. So if they were to come out here and just like really like run through a team that what they were supposed to do. That would mean like okay, cool. One, all right. One that would mean cool that this team just might be that good. Two, that would mean okay, they might really have matured from being the Celtics who like give games away or play down to their opponents. Like that's to me, I think the second part is the biggest thing that would impress me, make them me believe in them even more. Would be the fact that they would see know the moment and be like, look, we can't waste opportunities, we can't waste games, we don't need to play extra games. We're ten times better than this team without Halliburton. We're already like way better than this team, even with them. Let's mm-hmm. just like come out here and really show them that we're the better team. So if they did that, I would feel a little bit better. I'm gonna be honest, but like to me, it's still it, it's not like a huge, huge difference to where I'm like, oh, they can't win it now. Whereas if they did that, it's like, oh my god, they're running away with it in the final. So um, it's like I said, I like it a little bit better. But again, you just have to give credit to them because they did come out with a win in these games. Mm-hmm. It'd be different if they really blew a game, blew two games, and that's like, bro, you're going six with the Pacers without right, Halliburton. Right now, Halle, yep. Now, if you do that, now it's like, I right, really think the Mavs are gonna win. Like, I don't even believe in y'all because you're really blowing games for no reason. You know what I mean? Giving yourself opportunities for guys to get hurt, just not getting as much rest, um, not letting Chris just, uh get enough rest to come back. So it just to me, I, you do have to give them credit for the fact they actually won these games um, and didn't really um, give any away, which is good. Um, as far as how I feel about Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum going into the finals, I mean, they played well. Um, they definitely played well. Obviously, Jalen Brown won Eastern Conference uh, player um, – or Eastern Conference MVP, I should say. He, I thought he won it because he played well, obviously, and also hit that big shot in game one as well. I feel like that kind of helped his case a little bit. But in reality, it did what they were supposed to do. They handled business. Um, it was a team that I feel like shouldn't have gave them much pr- tr- troubles, I should say. Um, they should have been able to come here and have a good series. So my confidence level going into the next series for them, I feel like they're going to – I feel like – to me, they don't really have an, a reason it's to not have good series and good playoff games. You know what I mean? Like they've been here before. They've been in this moment. They faced good defenders before. It's not like I mean, obviously, I know the Mavs have a great defense, but it's not like they haven't faced good defenders before. I feel like they'd have no reason to not come out and have a really good series. So, this series in general, I want to say, just kept me neutral on the Celtics. Like it didn't make me lower. It didn't make me like crazy higher on them. I just felt like it just kept me neutral on the Celtics. But because I always felt like they were a team that were going to be in the finals, and it's good enough to win the finals. So to me, you know, everything. It kind of stayed the same from my end. Yeah, that's fair. That's definitely fair. You know, like they – and I asked that question specifically because I was listening to uh, – they were talking about on numbers on the board, and D. Mills said that he really has some serious doubts about the Celtics because of how these games went, the fact that, you know, three of the four of them were close, and everybody else really kind of dogged him for it being like, well, what do you want them to do? Like, they still swept, you know, like they swept the Pacers. Uh, but I think it's a fair argument because not all sweeps are the same. Like, you go back to the Lakers series last year against Denver. That's a, it's a that sweep a, on paper. That was a game, that was a seven-game series sweep. That's what it right. felt like. <laughs> it, it, every single game was tight. And I think people watching this would, would say that this was an exciting Eastern Conference Finals, despite the fact that, Every, I don't think anybody at any point in time thought the Pacers had a chance. While at the same time acknowledging that the Pacers were in three out of these four games, should have realistically at minimum won game one. You can make the same argument for game, uh, was it game two or game three? three. Game three. Um, and, you know, they were, were competitive against a team that no one gave them a, a real chance to 
to be able to, to be. So I think it's fair to say, you know, yeah, it's great that the Celtics were able to erase an 18 point deficit. You like, you give them their type of flowers, like, wow, like they just were able to, to turn it on and just be like, nah, we're the better team. But at the same time, are y'all down 18? And you can chalk it up to, yeah, the Pacers were shooting something ridiculous in that first half of that game. Like, it was like 67% from the field or 67% for three, something crazy. They just were lights out um, from the field in, in game three. Um, and then the Celtics were able to just turn it on. They got a couple of stops there early in the third quarter, um, turn their defense up, and then that 18-point lead, like, evaporated instantly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it's fair to hear out both arguments to say, like, yeah, you would have liked them to be more, you know, dominant in those games. But at the end of the day, they won every game. <laughs> like, And guys and, were playing out of their minds so from the Patriots. Right, like, right. McConnell was hooping. Nemhart was hooping. Like, the guys were like – like Jalen Brown said, it was like guys turned into Michael Jordan out there. Like they were, they were legitimately like right. out there playing with no fear, no nothing, like just absolutely hooping. So yeah, um, and, that actually plays a factor too. And I'll be honest, like I was one of those guys that at first was like, man, like y'all don't need to be in these close games with the Pacers. But I really some like taking some time to sit back, think about it, um, and understand that like, like he said, like guys are in the conference finals, they're playing with house money. They're just going to go out and play freely because I think as much as they won't admit it, like they understand nobody's betting on them to win. Nobody's picking them to win. Like there's not as much – there's way more pressure on Boston than it is in Indiana in this series. So, again, great performances out of guys like Nemhard, guys like TJ McConnell, who otherwise are typically role players for this, this Pacers team. And then Nemhard had to step up and really be the guy. Um, mm -hmm. for the Pacers after it's Oliver so easier, went down. It's so much easier to do that when you have no pressure to do nothing. Like, if Nemhart right. played stunk, nobody would be like, nobody would be killing Nemhart. They'd be like, okay, he's not the guy. Of course not. But, right. like, bro, he's playing super free, especially the games when they're at home. You're playing super free. Nobody expects nothing from you. All the pressure's on the Celtics. Yeah, I'm going to come out here, and I'm just going to hoop and see what happens. So Right. Um, But, look, like I said at the beginning of this, I was, if anything I take away from this, I was very impressed with their late game execution on both sides of the ball. Um, I don't remember which game it was that Drew Holiday got that that steal off of Nemhard there late to to really seal the game. I want to say that was, was that game four? three. Was that four or three? It might have been four, actually, now I think about it. I think that closed out the series, honestly. Um, it was one of those two. Definitely three or four, though. Yeah, but, but, you know, that type of performance, Jason Tatum down the stretch in overtime in game one, um, the, the type of performances that Jalen Brown put together when they had it both going um, in game three, the, just the way that they were able to seize the end of every single game, that's something that has to be a part of a championship team. You have to be good at closing. Um, so from that aspect, I do feel a little bit better about the Celtics going into this series, although despite the fact the Dallas Mavericks have you can make a case the two best closers in the NBA on their team. And boy, was that on full display in game five. If you watch the video that I posted, I said, I don't think Luca and Kyrie, they don't, they said, what? What's a game six? We don't, we ain't going to game six. There's 0% chance this game was getting, the series is getting extended, bro. <laughs> I, so, minor backstory i don't know what's been going on with the tv in my living room it no longer allows me to cast from my phone or my laptop to my tv and there's no tnt app on samsung tvs to just watch it so i was like either i gotta come in here and go to my office and watch it on my tv in here or i was watching it on my phone and so for the first quarter i was sitting on the couch watching it on my phone and after Luca made, I think it was his seventh or eighth field goal of the quarter, I jumped off the couch and came in here. So I was like, no, this has to go. This has mm -hmm. to go on a bigger screen than my phone. 20 first quarter points for Luca. Reggie Miller said it on the broadcast. Every single shot that he hit, nothing touched the net. Nothing, it barely touched the rim. Everything mm -hmm. was, you know, when you hit the back of the rim so perfectly, it just, it just dropped. Yeah. Right. 
everything was cashing like that. Even the heat check. He took a heat check three coming off a high screen, like a 33, 35 foot three, knocked down, back of the rim, swishes it. 21st quarter points for Luca. Um, Kyrie then starts getting it going in the second and third quarters. It feels like anything either of them wanted to get to in this game. They just they just had it. Mid range was there at the cup finishing. It was there. Three point catch and shoot coming off a screen. Everything was there, and they were knocking it down. They both finished this game with. 36 points. Kyrie Irving outside of now that they lost game four, that was the first time he had ever lost a closeout game in his career. I believe now he's 15 and one in closeout games in his career, which is a ridiculous stat. And I said in the video, I think we need to start having a conversation about Luca in these closeout games because this felt very similar to when he went up against Devin Booker and the Suns. And there's that little picture of him with Devin Booker at the free throw line looking at him like this because <laughs> they embarrassed Phoenix that day. One of the big reasons I think that that started the timeline that led to Monty Williams being fired, they embarrassed the Minnesota Timberwolves. And I, I have to know they did that against Phoenix in Phoenix. They did that against the Timberwolves in Minnesota. Embarrassed them. They were down by 30-plus Early in the second half, Minnesota crowd was booing the Timberwolves a ton, which is tough because I'll be honest with you, I don't know what they were supposed to do. Like you can make an, you can definitely see they definitely packed it in early, and they tried to go on some runs in the third quarter after it was already said and done. But look, at the end of the day, when Luca and Kyrie have it going like that. What did uh was it Austin Rivers who said they asked him when when Damian Lillard was giving him buckets in the bubble what he was gonna do and he said pray you just you just gotta pray bro sometimes Seriously. when you put and I think I also said this in my video it's a luxury to have a guy like this who you can put the ball in their hands in these critical moments in a winner go home scenario in a closeout scenario at the end of the game where you need a bucket you can be like. Man, I'm confident he's going to give it to me. It's a luxury to have one. He got, got two. two. He got two of them. And man. when the both of them are going off like that, to the point where it's like, man, we already up by 10-15. If I'm P.J. Washington, man, it's, it's easy breezy from the wing. I'm knocking my threes down. I'm, Der I'm mm -hmm. Derrick Jones. You know I'm knocking pressure. my threes down. Mm -hmm. It just turns into an avalanche, man. So the Mavericks end up gentlemen sweeping the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, and the last thing I'll say before I, I turn it over to you is I want to hear your thoughts on this game and this series as a whole. It's unfortunate because it really in every other game this series where the Timberwolves had a chance, they got performances from Nas Reed. They got performances from Jaden McDaniels. They got it from Slow Mo. They got it from Mike Conley. We were missing Ant and Cap. And game five was the first game where both of them had it going at the same time. And Everybody else was a no-show. <laughs> you got nothing from nobody else. You got 28 from Ant. You got 28 from Cat, And nobody else could touch double figures. That's the story of the game. For that. That's the story of this series. You could That's not true, yeah. think of one game where you got performances from your stars and a guy. If we look at the Mavericks, there was almost always a guy. Outside of this game five, because you don't really need a guy when your stars combined for 72. Mm -hmm. But even still, you still got, you know, 12 from PJ. You got 11 from Gafford on top of the fact that he <laughs> turned into Matumbo in this series, erasing everything at the rim. But as a whole, like, Derek Lively was obviously super productive in these series. Same thing with Gafford, PJ. Derrick Jones Jr., Jaden Hardy had his moments off the bench. Maxi Cleaver coming back. Um, he knocked down a three in this one as ugly as it looked. It looks like he's starting to get more comfortable just letting it go because obviously he's has to, even though he has the you know shoulder injury. Like teams have to respect him for him to be super viable on the floor. But outside of that, just he feels like he fits so good with this team because of how he can match up using his size on the wing. Like they always had those contributing forces on top of the fact that you got Luka and Kyrie going nuclear in every single game. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to you. 
talk to me about this series. Talk to me really about just this duel of Kyrie and Luca. And I have it here in my notes. I, I I want you to actually start here with this question because Stan Van Gundy talked about it a ton this entire series. Is this the best offensive backcourt of all time? No. It's no? Not. No. What about the best talented offensive back? There we go. Time? Now we're talking. We got to be specific with these certain things just because. All right, put it this way, right? <clears throat> so, best offensive backcourt ever. Meaning, like, I mean, obviously, you know, scoring, what are you doing on the offensive end, playmaking, things like that. And also, what you do with it as far as like, it doesn't matter if you're the best, like, most talented if you don't win nothing then you can't be the best you know what i mean the only reason why i'd say no is strictly because they haven't won the ring yet but a guy like like steph and clay whether even though like clay i think Kyrie's better than clay of course especially like if you're just talking about like offensive skill wise obviously clay's a better shooter but just as far as like offensive like skill wise and scoring the basketball Kyrie's better but they won, they won so much, it's hard to discount them to the greatest shooting back court ever. So that's a little bit tough. So you got to give them their respect. But if we're just talking about just like, you could say, bet like scoring as far as just like offensive talent, they're de- they could be, yeah, I'd say they're the best. Cause I don't see no, I can't think of no duel in my, in my head right now that's better talent, like offensive. How can I put this? Their games are so like refined offensively to where they can score from every single point on the court they can both shoot they can both get to the mid-range they can both are they're both great iso scores great off the pick and roll they can both get to the basket Kyrie's one of the best like non-dunking finishers ever like it's it's offensive skill wise I think they're the best because like I said bro you could put the ball in both of their hands and just say bro just give me a bucket bro yeah. and they can get you that bucket in like 30 different ways right <laughs> so that uh, talent wise for sure. They're definitely the best, I'd say. Um, but yeah, man, no, this backcourt is insane. Um, obviously, like going into the playoffs, and especially like as we get further and further into the playoffs, I was thinking about you know what it would take for the Dallas Mavericks to actually, you know, go ahead and go all the way. And in reality, obviously, you need contributions from guys like PJ Washington, Derek Live, who's been playing amazing, um, Derek Jones Jr. You need con- contributions from those guys. But in reality, for you to win this, like win the finals. You need Luca and Kyrie to go off. Like you need them to be on some 36 and 36 yeah. type of time for you guys to win the finals. And they're both capable of doing that. Like obviously Luca's gonna do his thing. He's always gonna get his numbers no matter what. Kyrie is at a point now where he seems like he seems so much smarter to the point where he knows when it's his time to score the basketball. He knows when it's time for him to go off. Like even in game one, right? He was like, you know. He went from in the OKC series to I'm um, you know second half I'm gonna like close this out kind of thing to no game one I'm gonna set the tone like I'm gonna score what was twenty some points in the first half because I've been to the conference finals before I know what it takes so he just seems so much smarter in the fact that he knows when to pick his spots and when it's time for him to actually you know score the basketball and him and Luca just seem like they're so connected to where it's like it 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 never feels like it's like your turn my turn in a bad way it's more like you got a good matchup right here, or you got to go in now, like, go at it, go do it. All right, right. let me go do it real quick. Like, it just, it seems like it's connected. It doesn't seem like, uh, just, it doesn't seem like the Suns, right? The Suns was just like, Katie, yeah. you go, Booker, you go. Like, it didn't, it didn't feel That's right. That's because it was so ISO heavy, but like, both of them, part of what I think makes the Mavericks so special this year is Luca has seen every single, in this series alone against the Minnesota Timberwolves, he saw every single coverage you could imagine against a pick and roll. They played mm-hmm. drop. They tried to hedge. They tried to have somebody up at the level of the screen. They tried to blitz him. They tried, they tried to, blitz, to trap yeah. him before the screen even came. Every single coverage that they threw at him, he had a counter to it. And at the same time, you have Kyrie, who is a better catch and shoot player than Luka is. But then at the same time, if it ever has to come to it and you want to trap and get the ball out of Luka's hands, Somehow it'll find its way to Kyrie Irving. You want to throw those same coverages at him? He'll do the same thing. He'll drive off that drop and he'll take that one step. It looks like he's going for a left hand floater. All of a sudden it turns into a lob and oop, Daniel Gafford throwing it down right behind your big man head. Mm -hmm. They both can pick apart every single type of pick and roll coverage that you can throw at them. And they have two bigs who are so dynamic, lively. I think 
his playmaking, I've said it a ton, but is is so impressive. Just he feels so much comfortable that you can hit him on the short roll. Yes. And when Gafford does it, it, a lot of times it feels like it's a, it's a huge difference, bro. Right. It's a huge difference. Like you can feel it when it's ga- when it's Gaffer or when it's anybody else other than Lively. And I think that's like to me, that is like the most underrated part of what he brings to them. 100%. The fact that he's making those plays off of the short roll. Because a lot of people think it's just like, oh, he's a rim protector. He's catching a lot. Of, like, no, bro. Like, you can trust him in that situation right. to make the right play. And the game that he missed, you literally felt that. Or anytime 100%. he's not on the court, you feel that. So, yeah, yeah. He, he's a big part of it. Because there, there's times in this series where they hit Gaffer on short roll, he getting ripped up. Hey, Gaffer on short roll. He's traveling. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah facts, just, facts. <laughs> just lively gets it. He just feels so cool, calm, collected. Sometimes he go he'll put it on the deck real quick. Sometimes he'll hit it to the wing. He'll hit it to the corner. He'll calm, slow. It just feels so much more under control. His decision-making has been great for a guy his age. Um, but, yeah, this, this Mavericks team has been super, super impressive. And, and to your point, like, they have two guys with similar skill sets. But because they're so dynamic and how they're able to play off of those screen actions, it doesn't feel like when the Suns just go ISO heavy. You try to get a bucket, KD. You try to get a bucket, D book. It involves every one of the team at all times because if you come in and blitz in that pick and roll, that wing is an option, that corner is an option, the roll man is an option. I'm still an option because there was times in this series where Rudy's coming up for that, that trap or that hedge or Cat's coming up for that trap or that hedge. Kyrie's still right by him every single time. So there's there's never a time where you can just feel like you're 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 shrinking the floor, boxing it up to limiting what is available to the Mavericks because Luca and Kyrie are so dynamic that everything is always an option. And that really transitions really perfectly into starting to get into this preview between the Mavericks and the Celtics because to be fair. The Mavericks, or excuse me, the Celtics have the most dynamic options to throw at both of them of anybody that Dallas has played this entire playoffs. While at the same time, the Celtics haven't had to guard anybody at Luka's level and definitely not somebody at Luka's level with Kyrie with him. So it it really sets up what is going to be a very, very interesting coaching matchup between Jason Kidd and Joe Missoula. When we look at it from the Celtics perspective, which is really where I want to start, um, like between Drew and Derek White and Jayla Brown and Jason Tatum, they got a lot of different things and a lot of different bodies that they can throw at Luka and Kyrie and just try to figure out, man, what is going to really work the best? What's going to disrupt either of them the best? Um, and I've seen people try to make the argument that, ah, you know, maybe Drew is a little bit too small to guard Luka, but I wouldn't put anything past Drew Holiday. Nothing past Drew Holiday. He's a guy who I think has more than proven himself to be a effective defender against everybody but legit fours or fives in this league. And even then, he's a guy who has such good active hands. He's just so, so smart from an IQ perspective that he can still be effective in bursts in individual possessions against guys who are bigger than him. So I just, I think from that standpoint, this is going to be the biggest test for Luca in his playoff career in terms of what he's going to see on the defensive side of the ball. Um, Well, again, at the same time, on the opposite side, if you are Boston, we just saw Luca abuse every single coverage against the number one defense in basketball. So the 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 matchup that is going to be had there from the guard spot um, is one that is going to, I think, really define this entire series because for the Mavericks, everything starts with Luka and Kyrie. And if you're able to find a way to get one of the two of them even just a little bit uncomfortable, like you said, you're going to need both of them to be having these huge type of performances combining for 70 plus points. And if you can hold one of them to 15, 18, 20, like that's opportunity for a game to win. If you can do that a couple of times, that puts the Celtics in a position to uh, potentially come out on top in this final. So I, I want to hear your thoughts about the Celtics options um, at trying to guard this combination of, of Luca and Kyrie. I mean, honestly, it's just more so 
they like I said, they have the best options between anybody in the league because they have so many great defenders that they can put on them. Like you have a guy like like you said, Drew Holiday, but you still have Derek White, you still have Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are also great defenders in their own right. right. So I mean they have the bodies that if you feel like if there's anybody that's gonna give them the most problems in the Luka and Kyrie, they have those options. It's just a matter of Will it actually work? Because when you're at, like, especially a guy like Luca, he is at a point where it's like, bro, you could doesn't matter who you put on him, he's gonna get his. No matter who the defender is, no matter how elite of a defender he is, he's gonna get his. Um, so it's really just a matter of, I think you don't making it as tough as possible. If we're strictly just talking about how you're gonna defend these guys, making it as tough as possible. Um, to where it seemed like in the previous series, right, they got whatever they wanted. Like it didn't matter what like defensive coverage they seen they were able to one also get also they were able to one get their um get themselves off whenever they wanted to mm-hmm. and also make the right play and pick apart the defense whenever right. kind of thing. um Celtics I feel like a better can do a better job of taking away those other options even if it's just them kind of going off on their own um because we're strictly just talking about them defending them like I said this if anybody if anybody's gonna do it it is gonna be the Celtics um, but then again, like I said, when it's a guy like Kyrie and Luca, like I still have confidence in them that they're gonna get their numbers, they're gonna still um have their games because nobody can really stop those guys. Right. Um, but that that then really begs his next question. Like, it's gonna be tough and it's really hard to stop <clears throat> guys like Kyrie and Luca from getting their numbers. But this entire playoff run has really been, you know, Part of the biggest offensive game plan for Dallas has been being able to get those easy baskets at the rim for guys like Dafford and Lively. Mm. Do you think the Celtics are going to be able to have an answer? Because from a size perspective, obviously you have Chris Apps, who's an underrated, I think, rim protector, in my opinion. But outside of him, you're looking at Al Horford and then Luke Cornett at being guys to have to play in that drop, play at, you know against the dunker spot and try to – disrupt those lobs against uh you know Gafford or Lively and we saw even in this this series against the Minnesota Timberwolves like Gobert tried but so much of that comes down to the fact that Luke is able to put a guy in jail behind him and then Gobert gets in that no man's land and all it takes is that one little step and that pass is going right over his head so, so do you think the Celtics have the personnel and can from a perspective of it doesn't even have to be really, you know, KP or Al Horford, but like you need to have a guy who you're willing to just leave him on that island. And if you're going to take away those lobs, you just have to be like, look, if Luca or Kyrie is getting downhill and they get into that mid range high paint area, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving Gaffer lively. Like I'm taking this lob away. Do you think that's a A is something that the Celtics could do or B something that they should really look into eliminating entirely because sometimes those lobs just they come at the most inopportune times when you can have the crowd really long, right crowd is going you have long possessions you feel like you've played such good defense for 19 20 seconds and now nowhere what looks like is going to be a tough floater over a guy or a tough mid-range shot is really a pass to gaffer right on the right side of the ring honestly i don't think that there's anyone that can stop it just off the fact that Kyrie and Luka are so skilled in that pick and roll, like you said, putting guys in jail and putting that defender in that tough situation to where they are in no man's land and they kind of make that decision. So in reality, like I said, I think that they have great personnel to defend it as best as possible. With that being said, I still think it's not possible when those guys are going to defend that because, like I said, you really have to make that choice. So in reality, I feel like it's going to be a matter of choosing one or the other, right? If you're going to fully eliminate those lobs, then it's tough because then I feel like Kyrie and Luka are kind of have whatever they want scoring for themselves. Um, I can see it from a standpoint of like, maybe you want to eliminate the lots. Cause like you said, they come at the worst times. They get the crowd going like that. It gets the team going, things like that. Um, and when a guy is kind of just going off like Luka or Kyrie, it's like, yeah, they're going to get their numbers anyway. Let, maybe let's not try to let these other guys get involved as well to get the whole team going. So it might just be a decision of, what do you want to live with? Because at the end of the day, when a guy is so offensively skilled, you're going to give up something. And especially when a guy is so skilled passing-wise, because Luka not only makes the right play for himself and is able to score from anywhere, he also is always a guy, a guy like him and Jokic 
will always make the right pass no matter what. They will always right. find the open guy. They will always hit the lob at the perfect time. So that's a little bit tough from that aspect. So I think it's just going to be a matter of picking your poison and figuring out which one you'd rather live with. Honestly, that will probably come more so in like a game to game adjustment type of thing. Like you'll mm-hmm. see how it goes. Like maybe you'll try one thing for the game one, right? That works. Maybe it doesn't work. They're going to obviously adjust to that. Then at that point, you adjust to that adjustment. So I think like that's going to be like the, like for the last series, right? It was how do you defend the pick and roll? Would you guys blitz? Do you drop? Like that's how it was for Minnesota. I think that's going to be the biggest thing for the Celtics is figuring out, all right, what's the best way to defend this and it's just gonna i think it's gonna change game by game like i don't think you'll see a set thing every single time because if you do then you're definitely getting killed because then luke and Kyrie are gonna get adjusted to that and then you're screwed so i think you'll just see um i think that would really just be a test to joe Missoula, his like adjustments and how mm-hmm. he's able to adjust to the adjustments because obviously jason kidd's not just gonna let you make an adjustment and just sit on his hands so i think right. that's a good that's a good thing to look out for game by game to see how they defend that yeah, and you bring up a good a good point with Joe Missoula. Like he's going to be under the the <clears throat> microscope this entire series. Obviously, this is his first uh, trip to the NBA Finals as a coach. Well, same thing oh, with Jason oh. Kidd as well. What's it? Oh, that was a uh, email. I forgot. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, but um, Missoula has definitely seen more criticism. Obviously, this only being his second year as the head coach of the Boston Celtics. People have been very critical of his style. They've been critical of his you know, adjustments critical of his timeout usage. Um, so I, I'm very interested to see how he kind of goes game by game with these matchups because, like I said, I don't think Jason Kidd has to do a lot offensively. And part of that just has to do with the benefit of having Luka Kyrie on your team. But defensively, he has coached a phenomenal, phenomenal series uh, against Minnesota and really this entire playoff run. Um, I have another stat here which continues to go into – you know, really the X's and O's and, and schemes that we're going to see in this uh, this NBA Finals matchup. Uh, but something big to note and going to be contentious throughout this entire series, this entire regular season, the Celtics held uh, their opponents to a league worst 35.2% on corner threes. Um, and that's actually going even better into the playoffs. They're number one in the playoffs in field goal percentage allowed out of those corner threes. Um, down to just 23.5%. Or on the flip side, uh, Dallas took more corner threes than any other team in the NBA, over 920 attempts. And then this postseason, they've hit over 40% of their threes that they've taken from the corner. Um, Doncic has also thrown 318 passes that led to corner three attempts, which is 71 more passes than the next closest player. Um, this playoffs that has been PJ Washington. That's been Jared Jones Jr. Um, it's been Josh Green sometimes, even Jaden Hardy. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of Tim Hardaway Jr. as of late. It really feels like Jaden Hardy has eaten into those minutes. Um, I'm interested to see if that's a button that Jason Kidd pushes at all this this series. But you have to say that that is a testament to something that I've said all season: how connected Boston is on defense when they are really locked in. When they talk about the saying of guys playing on a string, it feels like Boston, uh, you know, really emulates that and puts that on display in full force. Guys are rotating and it's like seamlessly how the guy next guy comes, the next guy comes and the help defender. People are always helping the helper. It feels like they just play so in sync with one another. Um, And that's going to be fully put to the test. And this also goes back to that type of pick and roll coverage coverage and what you're going to do. Um, because Luke is a guy who can be on that right wing and still make that skip pass to the opposite left side corner. And that could be a PJ or Kleber or whoever is over there at that point in time. So, um, you know, really, what do you think about particularly Dallas's role players? Um, because they've gotten phenomenal shooting performances from both PJ Washington and Derek Jones Jr. as of late. Is that something that can be sustained going into the finals against a defense that's as connected as Boston? Can it be sustained? Um, I think they'll have games. Like, obviously, I think there'll be time. Well, they'll put it this way. 
for them to win, I feel like guys will need to have games because as great as it is that Kyrie and, and Luca can both go off for 30, 35 plus, you're not going to win four games against Boston with just those two guys going off from that aspect. So you need them, the role players, to be able to open stuff up. So when you do get those open looks, you do be able to knock down those threes. Um, probably more so at home versus on the road because obviously role players play better at home. Um, so you probably you'll see maybe a game or two here that a PJ Washington had hits three or four threes. Um, Derek Jones Jr. hit some like timely three pointers. So, like I said, I have confidence in Luca and Kyrie will kind of do their thing, especially Luca more so um, than anyone else. But I think other role players will have games. I think they will step up from time to time. Mm-hmm. I don't know how consistent it would be. Is just as far as like the entire series. Um, ideally, and this is not even just for the Mavs. This is for like just every team in general ideally you're in a perfect world in the series you want your role your main guys to go off and you want at least one of your role players every single game to have at least a good game that's right. normally how it works but the maps a little bit tough because i mean well, it's not t- like they can have a guy go off each game i just like obviously we're living in a perfect world here but i think that like i said i think that they will have enough games to where they could they can pass for their role players as far as like Maybe a, a guy hits three or four threes here. Maybe you get a few off the bench points here. Like I think they'll get enough from their role players to where it'll help them, you know, have a good chance in this series. Yeah, I I agree. I think it will be a game to game thing. I don't think it's fair to say that you're going to see this crazy regression out of PJ and Derrick Jones. Even though, especially for Derrick Jones, it's been you've been getting performances out of him that you are like, whoa. Yeah, it was it was a game against Minnesota where he was knocking down mid range turnaround fadeaways like whoa yeah and you don't even need all that that's right. just like a pl- that's just a plus but hey who knows like like I said each series just has like moments from a role player where it's just like we'll take it like you know right. what I mean like you're not expecting this but sure we'll take it it'll help us out in right and that, that's critical to every single championship run like Bruce Brown was so pivotal to Denver's run last year you always need. Huge, huge performances out of your role players because it, it takes more than your star or your stars to be able to, you know, win an NBA finals. Um, but with that, I want to run through these last couple of storylines before we give our official picks. Obviously, like I mentioned, someone is going to be getting their first ring, whether that is the duo of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown getting that monkey off their back, silencing the discourse that they've. Well, they've been to so many Eastern Conference Finals. It's now their second Finals. If they get it done now, a lot of that is quieted. If they don't get it done, and I don't think it will be deserved because if they don't get it done, it will almost certainly because we saw a ridiculous performance from Luka and Kyrie in the Finals. But people are going to be on their heads badly, badly. Man, and you, gross. you're going to have to deal with it for another 350 or so days if they don't make the NBA Finals next year at the earliest but it will forever be on their backs until they, they get it off. Um, obviously, on the flip side, though, if the Mavericks pull it off, Luka gets his first ring at just the age of 25. We'll have made five first-team All-NBAs. We'll have been top three in MVP voting, have a ring, probably have finals MVP. The resume for his age would be ridiculous, and it feels like it's honestly gotten underrated at this point. Like, I feel like he has fatigue from fans, even though he hasn't won a finals MVP or won a regular season MVP. But, like, gosh, this man won rookie of the year and then made first team all NBA five years straight. That's insane. Point guard guard in the West. In the West. Come on now. Um, Obviously, then that goes right into the fact that Kyrie Irving would be looking to get his second championship. First one without LeBron. I would hope that that would stop the discourse that he only got his ring because of LeBron. Because I said it last time. Do y'all not remember the graphic where they both had 41 points? I think LeBron needed Kyrie as much as Kyrie needed LeBron in that 100%. series. 100%. Um, but obviously, and I, I want to ask you this. If they're able to win this series, where does that rank Kyrie amongst the greatest Robins of all time because I think it's it's pretty much untouchable at this point that Scotty Pippen is the best number two ever. Six mm-hmm. rings with Jordan is going to be almost impossible to top that. But after that, 
you start to get a little bit of, of wiggle room and nuance there. I think Kyrie really legitimately has an argument to be entering the conversation for one of the best, you know, second stars to be the the Robin to somebody's Batman in NBA history. Where, where do you think that if they're able to pull it off this year, that, you know, where he ranks in that conversation? He's definitely up there for sure if he pulls it off this year. Um, also because he'd be doing it with two different Batmans, like at two different stages of his career. Um, That's true. Like, Scotty never did that. Exactly. Scotty's definitely won for sure just because that doesn't need to be explained. Right. Honestly, this guy isn't seen as a Robin, but you could literally cut his career in half if we're talking about like Kobe with Shaq and Kobe when he won it on his own. But if we're strictly talking about Kobe with Shaq, like he's he got to be too. If we're just strictly talking about him with Shaq, only mm -hmm. reason why it's a little bit tough because he's as a whole is not viewed as a Robin because he went right. there on his own. So yeah. even if we don't even have to count that one, but just obviously he would be in that conversation if you viewed it from that aspect. Other than that, man, I mean, I'm thinking about guys who won multiple, right? Um, even with like the Spurs, right? There was no like clear Robin. Like, no, it was there's like, not. There's not a clear Robin. And there was so much of a system team. Exactly. Like, Tim Duncan was always the guy, but it's like you got Tony Manu was always huge. Mm -hmm. Kawhi obviously stepped in in those later years and got himself a Finals MVP, even though he wasn't the guy. Mm -hmm. It's like they were they were so system focused. When I think of Robins, it's like. They got to be someone who's clearly the second best player on the team. Clearly, right, like you could you look at like Clay, maybe, but even um, then, it's like they only. So they only won one with him as a Robin, though, and that one fair. was the one that in 2015 where guys was hurt because it's like after that where, where Kyrie got hurt of all people. Exactly after that, it's like man, Kelly Olynyk is such a bozo for that. Guy. Yeah, that was corny. That was super corny. But well, no, he he hurt Kevin Love. He didn't want to yank the whoever hurt ball. whoever hurt Kyrie is corny. Whoever hurt uh, he had the knee injury, but Kelly Olynyk was one that was tussling for the rebound. And Kevin oh, he Love pulled this. Oh, that's what I was talking about. It out his pocket. Yeah, I'm mixing Kyrie and, uh, and Kevin Love's injuries together. Yeah. Um, but no, nah, it's after because after that with Clay, 16 they lost. 17 KD got there, so he's not the Robin. Um, and then when they won it again in 2022, he was not the Robin. He was not good. So that was Andrew Wiggins. Wiggins. <laughs> Wiggins. <laughs> Wiggins was the Robin at that one. So yeah. he's he he would be up there past him. It's a lot of people, it's not a lot of people who are clearly the second best player on the team and are viewed as Robins. Cause even when guys join and get together like a D Wade LeBron, D Wade's still viewed as a Batman because he won his own before he even went with LeBron. So he's not viewed as a Robin. So Kyrie, realistically, he could be too. <laughs> like I, he could be the second a guy. Fair case. I think it's a fair case for him there. Everyone, everyone else I'm thinking about eventually went on to win their own. Even with like Magic and Kareem. Magic made his was his own man after that. Mm -hmm. Like every everybody went out and you know did it on their own after the fact and became like viewed as more of a Batman and all the other Robins like they might have won one or like they might have not been fully the best the second best guy so yeah Kyrie legitimately could he could be viewed as number two like the second it's funny the second best second, second guy best. <laughs> <laughs> right. um speaking of Kyrie though obviously uh the most infamous quote told the Boston Celtics crowd that he was planning on re-signing. He wanted to see his jersey up in the rafters. And now he is returning to Boston as probably public enemy number one. I pray for his mental state because I know what they're about to, to say to him is about to be in Boston out of pocket. Oh, my. It's about out to get pocket. real. Whew. Real, real cancelable, real cancelable, <laughs> real, real cancelable, real quick. All I know is they win the series. He better step on lucky again. I, bro, oh my <laughs> gosh! Could you imagine what would happen if they win the series and he run over to the leprechaun? He should spit and on it. Like, I, should, I would if I was him. What? And then step on it. What? Oh, that's hard. Oh my god, that'd be crazy. That's what I. Especially if it's like a game seven or something like that. No, or if, if it's a game seven, eh, they they're not gonna. It's gonna be a game seven, game six or game seven. But like, if they win a close one, yeah, I'm going crazy, bro. I'm going crazy. Yeah. Um, and then vice versa on the Dallas side of things, you got um, Chris Apps, who had been in Dallas, had been a guy who was, you know, pegged to come in and be that second guy for Luca, and it just it didn't pan out. They've both been vocal, both Luca and Chris Apps, about saying that there was some immaturity uh, between the both of them when they were there. 
Chris Epps felt like he was very underutilized in Dallas, which looking back on it, I think it's very fair to say that he was because you see what happened when he went to Washington. He turned into this crazy great post player. Obviously, he's one of the best stretch bigs, but, you know, Dallas really just had him sitting in the corner, but he can do so much more offensively in terms of exploiting matchups, which I feel like Boston utilizes very well. Um, So that's going to be another huge matchup. I mentioned earlier, but Joe Mazzula going for his first ring um, as a head coach at such a young age, doing what it's fair to say he may couldn't (laughs) with this roster. Uh, Although obviously a different Celtics team, he did not have Chris Stapps or Drew Holiday at his disposal. Uh, Ime did when they played against the Warriors in 2022. But for, for Missoula to do it at his age, I, isn't Al Horford older than him? Like, he is younger. Missoula is um, the youngest coach in the league still. Right. I'm pretty sure. Let me double check. But I'm almost positive that Al Horford is older than him. Yeah, he's 35. Al Horford. Yeah, Al is 30, like 38 or 37. 39. So, like, right, he, he would be in his second year as a head coach uh, winning the NBA Finals younger than some of the players that he's coaching. Uh, that would be a very special achievement for him. And obviously, lastly, uh, Jason Kidd would be, I want to say, the second or third coach to be uh, someone who won a championship for an organization as a player and then as a head coach. Obviously, Bill Russell did it as both at the same time, which is still insane to think about. Um, but – the, the storylines, again, throughout this entire NBA Finals, if you're somebody that's just into it for that drama, for the storylines, it's chock full of them. And, and we're going to see them play out in real time. If you don't believe that that Boston crowd is going to boo Kyrie the second he touches the ball in game one, they're going to boo him like never before. Mm-hmm. And it's, I'm gonna be here for it. I'm right. Gonna I'm gonna drama. love that. I, I hope he comes to the arena, sage and everything. It's gonna be a lot of bad energy, bad vibe, bro. Cleanse it and drop Cleanse 50. It right. Please do. Please do. With that though, Dame, who uh, are you picking <clears throat> to win the NBA finals to lift up the Larry O'Brien trophy? <sighs> Okay, <clears throat> let me walk. Let me walk everybody through this one. All right, this is this is what I'm. This is what's going through my mind, right? Because honestly, honestly, this whole episode I've been thinking about who I'm picking. I've been thinking about who I'm picking. Me since, too. Me too. <laughs> since the man, I've been hoping you was gonna say something to convince me because this has been a hard <laughs> pick. So, all right, basically from the Celtic side of it, right? Sixty. No, no man. No, I'll start. No, yeah, Celtic side. Celtic side. So, sixty plus one team, right? I would say it's safe to say they have the better overall roster. If we're just talking about starting Fair. five, yeah. you know, better overall roster, things like that. They have two stars. Um, defensively, they match up well. I feel like as far as perimeter defenders they have, as far as just a team defense, I feel like they're obviously a great defensive team. Um, yeah, they like they they've been playing so well all year. They haven't really had any hiccups. They've been handling business. Um, they've been beating good teams throughout the regular season, coming to the playoffs. Obviously. Haven't had any any hiccups or anything like that. They've been here before. Um, I feel like Tatum is a guy that will have something to prove. I just having a stinker in the last finals. Um, Jalen Brown's playing well. I just think overall it's good vibes with the Celtics right now. Um, even though obviously the Pacers series, it was just people felt like they had a little bit of struggle, but in reality, they swept them at the end of the day. The Mavericks, on the other hand, they have the best player in the series. Like it's it's some people would say they got the best two. I wouldn't say that, but I wouldn't either. But I've heard people say it. <laughs> I've heard people say that too. Um, that you can definitely say, and I might go along with this. They have the two best closers in the series, like you oh, hundred percent. I think they do have that, and I think like the Celtics can't do at least from my opinion. They can win multiple ways. They can win games where they're not hitting a hundred threes a game. Yeah. They can get to the basket. They can win games in the mid range. They could hit a, a bunch of threes. They can win games multiple different ways. And like I said, I'll say it a second time because this is a big emphasis. They have the best player in the whole series. Potentially, if they win this game, win the series, the best player in the world. Oh, that combo is going to be nasty. I can't. It wait. is. So, with that being said, the only the differences, or no, with that being said, I feel like <laughs> the Celtics. 
should win this series. Like, if the Celtics don't win, they have no excuse, in my opinion. I feel like they have no reason to not win this series. When it comes down to it, I'm going with the Mavs in seven, man. I'm going with the Mavs in seven. I just, uh, I, the main reason why, and I, and mind you, I really wanted to pick the Celtics. I really did. I think it's going to be close. If the Celtics win, I would not be surprised in the slightest bit. Honestly, if the Celtics win, it could be viewed as like, bro, they were right there the whole time. Like they won 60 games. They done beat everybody. Like, duh. Like it could be viewed as like, yeah, stupid for not thinking the Celtics are going to win. But when it comes down to it, man, even though they did pull out those Pacers series, as a whole, not just that series, the Celtics' late game struggles have been a little bit questionable. It's just as mm-hmm. far as your trust factor in them and in Tatum in those like crucial moments against really, really good teams. Um, I still think that they're bound to probably give one game away or at least just have one questionable type of game. And in uh, NBA Finals against Luka and the Mavs, that could be enough to lose you a series. Um, I hope this doesn't happen. I truly hope this doesn't happen. I think Tatum has at least one stinker because that's just kind of what he does. So it's like it's certain things that I feel like it honestly, me picking the Mavs is more of just like a gut feeling against the Celtics a little bit because if the yeah. Celtics were any other team, I would be picking them because I feel like they should win this series. And then it also it comes down to Mavs, like I said, have the two best closers. And at the end of the day, there's not a lot of times where the teams even if you think the Celtics have a, a better roster, obviously it's not a huge talent discrepancy between the two. Obviously they're both in the finals. In that situation where it's like, even if it's like here and here, it's hard to pick against the best player in the series who is a all-time already playoff performer. So yes. Second most PPG in playoffs ever. It's just I <laughs> Only behind MJ. Bro, it's nuts. Yeah, bro, I just, I don't. It's, it'll be so hard for me to pick against Luca with Kyrie with him, a good defense and a good overall supporting cast. Like I, it's, I can't. It's hard for me to pick against that. Yep. So for me personally, I think the Mavs went in seven. I think Game Seven is going to be a historic game. I think Luca goes off in a Game Seven. Um, I don't think they blow him up by forty like you're doing with the Suns and Timberwolves and not like that. But I think. If there's anyone who I can trust in a game seven on the road in Boston, I think it'd be Luka Doncic. I think he went finals MVP. And then, man, I think them legacy talks is going to be – it's, it's going to be insane. So I, I'm going with the Mavs here in seven. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of your analysis. Like, you can't argue. Luka and Kyrie are the two best closers, I think, in this series. You can make an argument that the two best closers in the NBA, two of the best shot makers in the NBA – um, on paper, Boston has the better team. On, pa- on paper, Boston is the deeper team. I really liked what you said, and I think it still holds true. And, and it's been on display. Like we just talked about earlier, for Dallas to win this these games against Minnesota, for them to win our expectation, for them to win the finals, any game in the finals, like you need Luka and Kyrie to be dominant. We've seen Boston, albeit beating worse teams along the way in the East, Tatum hasn't had the best game some nights. Jalen Brown's been a little bit quiet some nights. Derek White stepping up. He giving you crazy numbers. That's a great point. Right. Like they, they don't need to have both of their stars have ridiculous games. That's a great because point. Because you could have a crazy performance from Derek White. Chris Stapps might come out and have a crazy performance. Drew Holiday messing around, knock down a couple threes. Like there's a lot of different options, like you said, for the Celtics to be able to win then Dallas feels like it all has to start with Luke and Kyrie have to be giving you 55 plus 60 plus combined points. If they're mm-hmm. not giving you that, you know what I mean? Like wh- wh- where's it coming from? Like, right. Like, unless it's just like, they're just out here dotting up your defense, but from the self creation aspect, it's got to come from them too. Mm-hmm. Um, I've thought a ton, a ton, a ton about this series schematically, matchup-wise, from both perspectives, what can Dallas do to defend Boston? What can Boston do to defend Dallas and Luka and Kyrie? The biggest thing that I think has, and I'm talking, moved the needle ever so slightly. 
And I'm going to preface all of this by saying I will not be surprised either way. First of all, I think this is a minimal six-game series. I I really think it's a seven-game series, barring any type of freak stuff going on. Um, I don't see a way – or I don't think that I would be surprised either way with these teams winning. I'm just going to preface my Mm -hmm. pick with that. But I really think that the thing that has – swayed me ever so slightly because we live in this world of we have to make a pick. <laughs> I do just genuinely like the supporting cast of the Boston Celtics just a tad bit more. I feel more confident in the shot making of guys like Chris Apps, Porzingis, and Derek White, and Drew Holiday, even though he's not the best historic uh, you know, field goal percentage, especially a true shooting percentage guy in the playoffs. But because it's like, in reality, you need Drew to be maybe on some nights, bro, not even a fifth option. You could really say you got yeah. JB, you got JT, you got Chris Stapps, you got Derek White. You might have Al Horford giving you buckets. So it's like, you don't even necessarily need to have Drew. So sometimes it's just like, just that extra, mm, just above to get you over. Mm-hmm. So for that, and because I had this on, because they made the finals, I ain't gonna disrespect them. So I'll take the Mavericks uh, jersey off. I, I was about to say that's a little crazy. I'm not gonna lie. Dang, not the give me Mavericks the Celtics jersey. Uh, not we haven't we haven't actually jersey. this entire playoffs disagreed a ton. Nah, not really. On, uh, on our, our our picks or our predictions, but. Yeah, man. Give me give me Boston in, in seven. I really do like let me get this hoodie on. Actually, y'all don't 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 try to chop. I need to get a haircut. Um wow. Yeah, I just I think their supporting cast. If, if I have like when it comes down to these series, man, you gotta win four out of seven. I really do see a world where yeah, you know, Tatum might have one one rough game, but like, ah, Derek White gave you 25. He knocked down five threes. You know, mm-hmm. Chris Stapps had a game. He knocked down four or five threes. He got you a couple of good blocks. Oh, shoot, he, he, he caught a gaffer lob at the rim. He met him up there. Like, I just think on top of the fact that if anybody is going to be able to disrupt Kyrie or Luka for just one or two games, it's going to be the Celtics. Drew's just going to have a night where he's just under, under Kyrie's skin. There's going to be a couple of quarters where it's like, man, Luca just is getting frustrated out there because they got so much length on him. JT is 6'10, bro. Like, uh, he, I just, I really have to put a little bit more faith in the options and flexibility that Boston has versus, yes, Luca is far and away the best player in this series, but their path to victory is very narrow. Boston's is a decent bit wider and their supporting cast, I think is so much more versatile and has a lot more to offer um, versus it's really going to have to be a knockdown series for guys like PJ Washington and, and Derek Jones. And, you know, you're still going to need those type of performances from Lively and Gafford. Whereas like, I could really see a world where any given night, it could be one of any of these random. We might get moments where Sam Hauser just starts sparking it. You know what I mean? Like it just mm-hmm. there's so many different ways for the Celtics to get there. But no matter what, I'm not gonna be surprised either way in this series. But if you if you force me to pick one, give me Boston and seven. I think the best thing that you said was the fact that you were like Tatum sometimes doesn't have to be this. 30 35 plus guy for them to win like they can get contributions from everyone all their role players or at least one of them to step up i think that's the biggest thing because the main reason why my like i said my pick like it's it's i literally am battling with myself right between i feel like logically the Celtics. like i said i said it the Celtics should win this series that's how i genuinely think but how I feel, I just it's hard for me yeah. to pick them because I feel like they will do one or two things that just is like the Celtics. Like, bro, they're they go to Celtics who like give games away 
or play down to their opponents or Tatum disappears or like they, they have a bunch of turnovers. Like they'll just or they they have a game where they miss every single three they take, but they keep shooting. Like I just something in me just can't get on board with that. And that's the main reason why I picked the Mavs. And like mm-hmm. I said, I trust, you know, Luca's never been to the finals. Luca's already a top playoff performer in my mind. I trust him in that spot. Kyrie, I at this point, I trust him. He hit one of the biggest shots in NBA history in the finals. Exactly. I definitely trust him in the finals. Um, so that's the, to me, that's the biggest thing. But I, I do feel like the best like counterpoint to what I just said was the fact that Tatum could have a game where he stinks. And Derek White gets you thirty, <laughs> and right. you he can go spurts of the game being not the guy on offense, and then it's like right. he can just show up when he needs to because they can carry the load when he's right. not being the guy. Absolutely, that can't so, happen for Luca or Kyrie. That's true. I think more so it's just a faith in. I think Luca and Kyrie are just that good that they can do that for four. They hours. They definitely seven. are. They yeah. are <laughs> like they can do. They can carry that load for four out of seven games. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I really agree with the fact that like, bro, I'm. First of all, I I love Jason Tatum. Like, he's one of my favorite players in the league. If he wins a ring, that's fine with me. Perfect. Like, uh, to me, I love this finals because it's also a win win for me. Regardless, like, I if Luca and Kyrie, Luca get his first ring, Kyrie get his second. That's great. Huge storyline. Fantastic. If Jalen Brown and JB get over the hump, perfect. Jason Tatum could finally get those. Like, uh, he's never gonna win a ring as the one. He can get that out of here. That's perfect for him. So to me, it's a win-win. I love it. Um, but yeah, I I would not be surprised either way. In reality, as a neutral basketball fan, I just I just what I want. I need a I want a Tatum game. I want a Kyrie game. I'm not even gonna count Luca. He's gonna have a game every, every game. Every game is a Luca every, game. Exactly. And I want a game seven like that. I just yeah. I would if we can get if we can get a game seven. I don't care who wins. I just need it to be a good one. Luca, please don't blow him out by 40 like you did the Suns. I don't need that. But if we get like a down to the wire game seven, Kyrie hit the same shot that he did from the same spot. That'd be crazy. <laughs> now, now, now we just script writing at this point. Right, we but, are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, nah, I, I just want a good series. That's all I want, man. The last thing I, I do want to say is, and I, I don't want to say it really impacted my decision because a lot of it really was just I tried to keep it just as much on the court focus as possible. But I really do believe we are in for a big time Jason Tatum final series. I there's I no so. way he's 100% heard the noise from last time he was in the finals from this entire season. All this uh, is he the guy? Is Jalen Brown the guy? Can Jason Tatum be the guy? Oh, look at him. He's not even really a superstar because his team just I really think he's just gonna be like, all right, bro. I think I really have to let y'all understand. I don't even know if it was remind y'all because some of y'all never believed him from the yeah, get go that he could exactly. be the guy. But they for put those y'all, y'all on, right? Those of y'all that never knew, I'm gonna let y'all know. Those of y'all that I thought, I'm gonna remind y'all, I really can be that guy. So I, I, I didn't so. want to have that persuade me one way or the other, but I do truly believe that he is going to show up this finals run because there's, there's no way he's going to let that become his legacy. That he's a guy that gets there and chokes it. I, I think he's so. too good and too talented of a player. But, yeah, Mavs in seven for you, Celtics in seven for me. Rare disagreement. The only thing we disagreed on picks. was I think I picked the Mavs in the OKC series. You didn't. I picked the Cavs in the Orlando one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's That's mostly it. it. Like, we were pretty, pretty on point mm. for uh, – for all of these these series throughout the playoffs, but yeah, either way, no matter how it goes, obviously neither one of us have a dog in this fight. Um, for the, like, if y'all watch the whole thing, I guess this might be clipped into a different video. I am not a Mavericks fan. <laughs> fan. I had it on. Think about it. This guy is a traitor. Right, this guy right. is like, what I'm is this? Say, somebody gonna clip this and be like. <laughs> Bro, who this man? <laughs> right. He, yeah, you're going to get killed, bro. Right. Not a Mavs fan. Just a Dirk fan was just, you know, for me. Felt hey, on brand on hey, occasion. What's the name uh Pierre from uh, Numbers of the Board? So he's like, look, I, and this is kind of like what I felt is too. It was like, look, I'm picking Boston to win. But when I'm at home watching it, like, I'm rooting for the Mavs. Like, I'm yeah, I, the Mavs I, I can 100% win. see that because yeah. they're the underdog, right? Like, yeah. they wasn't 
They wasn't necessarily even supposed to be here. Nobody was picking them to go. Well, some people picked them to come out of the West, but they were certainly not the favorite. Mm. They were not my favorite. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I said that them. whoever won Denver, Minnesota was going to win the finals. That's true. Neither one of them even made it to the finals. So. <laughs> Uh, this Mavericks team is going on a very, very special run. So, look, at, no matter what happens, I'm going to thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy this year's NBA Finals. I think it's going to blow last year's Finals out of the water. Oh, I can't wait, man. I can't wait. Let's do it. With that, though, before we get up out of here, really quickly, we are going to be doing some quick, you know, hand out some report cards <laughs> for every NBA team. We're going to start – with the Eastern Conference going through all 15 teams very quickly, giving a grade and a brief couple of sentences explaining why. I'm going to clip that into some shorts for y'all to keep the content flowing throughout the NBA playoffs because it's two days between games. Got to have something to post. Just didn't want to give them so much break, which is understandable. <laughs> right. I, I'm tired of seeing Luca's knee bleeding. But that's scab ew. No <laughs> that's oh, that was nothing I need. None of these. No injuries from nobody. Yes. Because if no. Derek Lively <laughs> couldn't play, I'd have been so mad if he could. Adam play. Silver need to turn the injuries off, bro. <laughs> no injuries. I don't care if it's Peyton Pritchard. I want nobody right. hurt, bro. I don't even want screen. Don't let me see Chevy McKay Luke hurt. Nobody <laughs> Every... wants the Celtics bench. Everybody. Protect the coaches too. We see what happened to Chris Finch, bro. Fact. I don't need Keep that. No sort of swivel. right. No sort of advantage. Just no. Right. Everybody, right. full strength. Let's do it. But we need you to grade every single NBA team's season. Starting out out east, we're gonna go fifteen to one in the standings. How are you grading the Detroit Pistons season? F. <laughs> F, <laughs> like you did, they break the the streak or did they are the record? For they the most tied it. I don't think they tied. They they set. I think the single season one, but they didn't break the longest of all time one because that spanned different seasons. Y'all being that close is an F in itself. Absolutely <laughs> F. Yeah, I didn't want to give them an F. Uh, I'm going to give them an F too, though. Unfortunately, <laughs> you can't. You can't. Fourteen and sixty eight F. It's just F. that's F, bro. F. It's not like you're like tanking, like, bro. Y'all have like your core, like, no, right? F, F. Next team is the Washington Wizards. What are you grading the Washington Wizards season? A D. I'll give them a D just because bad, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, and it. it it wasn't how I thought it was going to be. I thought they were going to be bad but fun. They weren't even bad but fun. It was just bad. Like, <laughs> yeah, just awful. <laughs> it was just bad. It wasn't no, like Jordan Poole pool party. He's like, nah, like, everything. Pool dried bad. up. <laughs> <laughs> the pool's closed for the it, summer, bro. It, it is, bro. It, it was just bad. So I give him a D. I, I give him a D minus because, like, just like you said, I had low expectations for the team's performance but they were somehow worse than expected and not even fun to watch. <laughs> not only, at all. Only thing saving them from the F, Bilal looked great. There's a lot of promise there. And uh, Denny Avedia is a guy, let y'all know now, let him mess around and get up out of Washington and get on a contender. He's going to show a lot of y'all why he's a he's somebody that can really contribute. And y'all helped the Mavs this season <laughs> as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that might bump you up to a D-plus, actually, because y'all helped the Mavs. <laughs> That's because y'all traded away Gaffer. <laughs> y'all helped the Mavs. It's so funny because we haven't talked about these bad teams in so long. I'm just – I got to remember the season again. It's, it's so weird. Right. Uh, yeah. Speaking of another bad team that, uh, that helped out the Mavericks, the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, what <laughs> are you grading the Charlotte Hornets season this past year? Honestly, theirs was like a – this is like a C minus kind of thing because it was bad, but they bad obviously because the Miller was hurt as well. Right. Um, I liked, I loved actually what I seen from Brandon Miller. Mm -hmm. They helped the Mavs again, so I give, I give them a C minus. I give them a C minus. I can't go that far. I still give them a D plus. Obviously, the Melo injury is the biggest thing, but it's starting to become a bit of a scary trend for him. Mm -hmm. Um, some of these injuries, but. Obviously, they trade away P.J. Washington, and now he's turned into what he's turned into on the Dallas Mavericks. It was like, wish you could have seen that on Charlotte, but tough to see, obviously, any type of great performance from role players on bad teams. Um, but just uh, underwhelming, and, and this LaMelo injury is super tough. So obviously not going to give them a crazy – they're not F-worthy, but 
a D plus just because of, man, LaMelo's got to be able to, to, to stay healthy in these instances because they got something there. And like you said, Brandon Miller was definitely a bright spot uh, because, you know, finishing up the season, you know, averaging over 17 points, he, he shut up a lot of the hate that he might not have been the pick there um, for Charlotte. So got to definitely give credit to him. You know, what? actually, I, I'll go C minus then just just off of that. It feels wrong. That's, the, the plus. that's what that literally is like because they're young. They weren't supposed to win anyway. And they have an excuse because LaMelo was hurt for the majority of the year. Right. And Brandon Miller was bigger, better than expected. That's why I both them up to the C. So I feel like if I'm giving them the same grades like the Wizards. It's like, damn. Like, that's they got, fair. They have more promise than that. Yeah, I, I do the C minus just, just because of that, because that is Brandon Miller did have a hell of a rookie year. Uh, next team out east is going to be the Toronto Raptors. How are you grading the Raptors past season? I'm going to give them. Mm, that's actually a really hard one. I think I'm going to give them a C. C minus as well for different reasons though. Mm -hmm. I like the C minus for the Hornets because they had an excuse to be so bad and they showed promise. I'm giving them a C minus for the Raptors because they finally made the decision to actually like reset a little bit. Right. That's why. But they obviously it wasn't a good season, so I can't get them higher than that. So it's a C minus, but it's for a different reason than I gave the Hornets. I'm gonna give them a I'll say C plus, but for the same reason, like. They got off of Pascal. They bring in RJ. They bring in Emmanuel quickly. It feels like they are really committed to building around Scotty's timeline. They brought in some younger complimentary guys to pair with him. I just think that's fair that they've made a choice, a decision. You don't want to be in that, you know, no man's land. So I'll give them a C plus for that. Um, you know, Scotty had a good year, was an all star. RJ didn't look too bad when he was there. IQ, they got mm. off of, you know, OG. Scotty know. was an all-star, yeah. I um, that. So I, I think that there's, you know, opportunity there for them, you know, moving into the future with Scotty. I think they just have some semblance of a direction. Um, so I'll give them a C plus, but again, obviously their expectations shift midseason when you were a team with Scotty, Pascal, OG, and then you get rid of Pascal, OG. Right. <clears throat> The next team that we have here, um, which is the last team that wasn't in the playing tournament at all out east, is the Brooklyn Nets. What are you grading the Brooklyn Nets season? They were like a ah, uh, they're like a D. I'm not gonna lie, they haven't got no direction. Like, it's not an F because you weren't like abysmal but you don't have no direction you're kind of in no man's land like yeah you're like it's like a d you better than me the nets are getting an f minus just the worst <laughs> worst out i don't care what the pistons did this is the worst because like you said there's no direction at all with this team that's true you brought in mikhail to be the guy is he the guy no. i don't i don't think so no but then you're not going to trade him for any of the assets that you could potentially go out to get a guy. You're not going to trade true. any other assets to try to get a guy. You got Ben Simmons on the roster. Cam Thomas is on the roster. I it, This roster is just a mosh posh of mid and directionless going nowhere. So for them to have been in a position just a few years ago where they had KD and Kyrie and were one game away, literally a couple of a toenail away <laughs> from advancing – uh, was that going to the Eastern Conference Finals? Right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And now to be in this position now where they have, there's nothing even to look forward to. If you're the Pistons, at least you're like, man, we got K. Like, we suck. We got K. We got, you know, we got Sar. If I'm a Nets fan, I'm like, I don't, bro, we need to do something, anything. F minus. That's just true. Just being in the middle of nowhere. And they also constructed the two teams in the finals, basically. 100%. <laughs> Next team is the Atlanta Hawks. What are you grading the Atlanta Hawks season? Uh, they're like a D minus because their expectations was a little – they because it was supposed to be a little bit higher. They were supposed to be a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, They didn't figure out the Trey Young and DeJounte thing. One of them is probably – one of them, if not both, is getting traded. I mean, do we are we counting the fact that they got the number one overall pick in there? Because then it goes up for that. <laughs> it could. You <laughs> could. Nah, D. I, I give him a D from a D minus. I, I, it's, 
not directionless because they have assets to move off of. They got decisions mm-hmm. to be made, so it's not like directionless and nothing to look forward to. But still, kind of disappointing. So I'd say like a D. I'll give them a C minus with an asterisk solely because really what they do this off season depends on how they're capitalizing off of this season and getting the number one overall pick. That's very true. I think it's clear we've reached the point where we can collectively as fans say this Trey on DeJounte Murray thing is not working. It's not working. Mm -hmm. So y'all need to make some shake. So when we get past next year's trade deadlines, when we'll really be able to be like, okay, how was this season really going to be remembered? So I'll give it a C minus for now because at the end of the day, they definitely were underwhelming, should have been better. Uh, than they were. I was a guy. I thought that the two of them could potentially work it out, but it just it ain't it ain't gone. It ain't gone. I, I bumped those a D plus. I give them a plus. Okay. Next one is the Chicago Bulls. How are you grading the Bulls season this past year? F plus, and the plus is Kobe White. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's what the plus is. Other than yeah. that, directionless, no man's land. No. F plus because the plus is Kobe White. That's it. Uh, yep, That's same it. reason. I give him a D minus. I don't even got to say anything more. The, the only reason it ain't in the F is because man, Kobe White could have been the MIP man. Mm. That's about it. Break fact, this. I will give up. him a D minus because Kobe White is worth more than a plus. Give him that. I give him that. So I'm with you on that one. I give him a D right. minus. Uh, yeah. You saw Alonzo Ball got a meniscus transplant. Bro, he has a, a whole somebody else's meniscus. That's How does that work? Crazy. I didn't know that was a thing. Was it like, did the person die? What if they weren't the same size as one? I got so many questions, bro. Bro, I don't know. And I I don't know how you're doing it. And then it's about to go play professional basketball on that. Someone else is in this. Right. That wasn't an athlete. How is (laughs) that? Right. That joke is not strong enough. That joke about to, nah, I don't even want to speak it into existence, but I'm good on that. Uh, Next team is the Miami Heat. What are you grading the Heat season this past year? It's not – it can't be lower like those. Yeah, that's like a – their season is like a C-minus kind of that's season. That's what I would give it to. Because it's not like a D or an F, but it's definitely not where it was supposed to be. Definitely they're didn't have a good regular season. That. Y'all are living in directionless land just quietly. It, it's creeping in directionless land. Let's, let's put it that way. I still have pieces. I still have options. Obviously, Bam, Tyler Hero, Jimmy Butler still, Jaime Hawkins. So, like, eyes, y'all like a C minus. I agree. I agree. C minus for the Miami Heat. Next team is the Philadelphia 76ers. What are you grading the 76ers season this past year? This season got an asterisk because, like, that's tough, man. I'll give them just a flat out B. Because they were supposed to be better, but it only was because of the Joel injury. Joel was supposed to win MVP. Like, I'll give him a B just because it's like either, it's just it's a tough one to grade. You know what I mean? Because I don't give right. them slack for losing in the playoffs at all with a hurt and bead. Um, I give him a B plus because Maxi actually had a little bit of breakout. So I give him a B, B plus actually. I, I was gonna give them a B plus as well. Um, obviously it hurt with the injury. But he came back, and they played the Knicks as close as you could play a six-game series. Tyrese Maxey was phenomenal. And I just love the decision to get off of Harden to have mm-hmm. Maxey be the number two option there. And I think he flourished in that role. Um, and I'm excited to see him continue to grow as a young guard in this league. So I, I give them a B-plus solely for that. Tough, like you said, with the the injuries to to grade it any differently. Now it kind of has to be an, an asterisk on their full performance because of that. Um. The next team I have is the Indiana Pacers. How would you grade the Pacers last season? Hey, if for, for as far as expectation, oh, completely overachieved, was not supposed to be in the Eastern Conference Finals, well above where they're supposed to be um, as far as like where they're at roster-wise. roster, roster wise, uh, Made the pass on the Siakam trade. Um, that's been going pretty well. Um, Hattarius Halliburton made all NBA. Like, yeah, I, I give him right. an A. I, it was a good season for him. Great season for him, actually. Same grade for me for the same reasons. You got an All-NBA player. You made it to the Eastern Conference Finals and were competitive in the Eastern Conference Finals um, despite getting swept. But we're in a lot of those games. I would have to say that that is definitely a success for a team that had nobody predicting them to have gotten that far. Definitely an A mm-hmm. for the Pacers. Uh, the next team I have is the Orlando Magic. How are you grading the Orlando Magic's season? Honestly, if we're just basing off – that's like a. I feel like A plus is crazy. I'm not gonna lie. 
I think I, I can. I wouldn't go I, that far. That's what I said. I think that's I think that's crazy because A plus is like you're like top of the top. I right. give I give them an A because of where they're at right now. Obviously had um at least like what well, was the top three defense in the league this whole year. Obviously had a huge strides from Paolo. Franz been playing very well as well. Um, I give them an A just because had a great regular season and played a tough seven game series for such a young team and showed strides in the playoffs. Like Paolo had moments, like your guys had moments in the playoffs when in reality you could have been a team that was playing like, you know, taking those, that step forward. And then you jumped all that a little bit. So I, I give them an A cause I think that they took a, they took a further leap than what I thought they was going to do. Yeah. I'll give them a, an A minus because the defense was fantastic all year. Paolo was great all year. Uh, and they pushed the Cavs to seven and I think still were good enough to be further. Obviously, they, they didn't perform, especially Franz, in the playoffs to the level that they want to. But the young team, I'm giving them a little bit of grace. But for them to be this far along in their rebuild already, definitely B plus A minus worthy. Um, the next team I have is... The Cleveland Cavaliers, how would you grade the Cavs this season? Mm, they had injuries. Donovan Mitchell kind of kept them afloat. I even when they was a ravaged with injuries. Mm-hmm. I'll give them a B plus. That's uh Darren Garland's kind of struggled this year. It's a tough one. Um, like a B to a B plus is the range for me. Um, because like I said, they Donovan Mitchell kept them afloat. Then we talked about it when they were like had all them injuries that like they could have they could have been bad. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, they could have been really, really bad. And then was able to stay afloat and then I win a playoff series one and then they got a game off Boston and then Donovan Mitchell got hurt. So we not we really don't know how that series really could have right. been for them. Who knows what would have happened? Um so it's kind of like an inc- a kind of like an incomplete, really. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I, I would say for what could have happened, how bad it could have been with all the injuries, it's like a B, B plus kind of thing. Yeah, same thing. I give it a B because it's hard to it's hard to knock them for the bad playoffs and some of the bad stretches because at the same time, Donovan Mitchell did carry them through those tough times when Darius Garland and Evan Mobley were hurt. And Darius Garland obviously never really returned to form because of his injury. And then Donovan Mitchell got hurt, and then he got hurt again in the playoffs. So it's like it's hard to really try to ding them for any of that when that's all out of their control. So B feels like a fair, safe bet. But it could be lower. It definitely could be a little bit lower because, again, tough to – and the rumors are kicking up again that they might have to break this core up because it feels like it may be plateauing a little bit out there Mm -hmm. in Cleveland – the next team I have is the Milwaukee Bucks. What would you grade the Bucks this season? This is a hard grade because if mm-hmm. we're talking about expectations and what they were supposed to be, hmm, man, they're no higher than a B for me. That's no, what I would give them to. No higher. I want to say they're lucky. They're so lucky Giannis got hurt. I swear to God. They're so lucky because I can't fully give them. I can't fully judge it because you don't really know. I'd say a B minus right now because mm-hmm. regular season was shaky. Fired your coach midseason after that didn't even really play great. Um, then they, they slipped a little bit in the same. What, that was a fourth seed, what was it? Fourth seed? They, they ended up being the three seed. They got three jumped seed. by the, the Knicks at the last Knicks. time, last hour. Got you. Day. Had like a couple bad losses at the end of the season. Yep. Giannis got hurt, so like I said, Giannis getting hurt kind of saves him a little bit because it's more so of an incomplete kind of thing. But I'd say uh, like a B minus, definitely no higher than a B for me. Yeah, I, I would give them a B because it's tough to give a team that won forty nine games less than that. But expectation wise, like you said, the injuries hurt. But I think there was a world where like they were underperforming for most of the season. So I could definitely be fair was seeing a lower grade for this team because even when they were fully healthy, they were not performing up to the standard. If you did this at the halfway point in the season, I don't care if they had one, were they like 31 and 13? This would have been like a C minus D plus. That Facts. defense was sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next team we have is the New York Knicks. How would you grade the Knicks this season? This is an A. This is an A season. For this me. is an A plus. 
I thought about the plus. I thought about the plus. I thought about the plus. I really, I really thought about the plus. I thought I didn't know if I was bugging or not. I'm with you now. I'm getting the A. I just needed yeah. your back. I needed you to back me a little bit. <laughs> I'm with the A plus. Brunson, all NBA, MVP yes. conversation yes. with the Randall injury. You bring in Bogdanovich. You bring in OG. Um, OG. You have this Josh Hart emergence. DiVincenzo playing out of his Deuce mind. Right. This crazy playoff run. Just it, it, the vibes were so high. MSG the vibes all was, uh, year. I was a Nick fan, bro. In the playoffs, I'm not gonna lie. I Nick wanted them to win every. I wanted them to win every single game they played, bro. I was so hyped for the Knicks. Like I said, Hartenstein stepped up through all the injuries. Every single injury, obviously, it caught up to him at the end. But in reality, we you know if they was healthy, probably would have went to the Eastern Conference Finals. I, yeah, a, it was a fantastic season for the Knicks. A plus yeah. for sure. And the last one, can't even really put a grade on it yet. Celtics are a TBD. Nah, because if they lose, because if they lose, it ain't no A, A-plus season. Not at all. I don't care. Bro, Celtics are a team you don't get judged by anything you do in the regular season. If we talk about straight regular season up to now, A-plus. Right. Of course, nothing lower. But if you lose, that grade drops. Obviously, mm. it's not even no F or no D or right, no crazy. Right. But this not no A. Can't yeah. be no A season. That's fair. That is fair. I like that, though. That's that's a quick little – definitely going to make a lot of shorts out of that. With that, though, that has been our full NBA Finals preview. If you made it through this entire video, watching or listening, be sure to go over to the audio platforms, drop a five-star review, go over back to YouTube, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. I already said I'm going to be posting a recap video after every single game in the NBA Finals. So make sure you have the notification bell on. Get the notifications. Stay tuned. Make sure you're following us on the social platforms at Off The Glass Pod on Instagram, at Off The Glass Podcast on TikTok. Don't miss a second of the content and the breakdowns because we are going to be diving in heavily to these NBA Finals. We're going to be doing some collabs very soon as well. Stay tuned. I can't make anything official yet. Once we get the dates and everything scheduled and solidified, be sure to stay tuned to the socials. We'll be announcing everything there. As always, I'm Billy. That's Dame. And we out. Peace.